Now, Kim Gusby presents another installment of her award-winning documentary series, WSAV's Black History Journey, sponsored by attorney Ken Nugent. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for WSAV's Black History Journey. I'm Kim Gusby. Tonight, we take a look at some of the people and places that have left an indelible imprint on our community and how they've inspired future generations. We begin right up the road in Liberty County with the remarkable story of a trailblazing pioneer who changed the course of history. Still, few outside of the Coastal Empire and Low Country have even heard the name Susie King Taylor. In the small town of Midway sits the first and only museum in the country, solely dedicated to the life of Civil War heroine Susie King Taylor. This is a album recording uh, read by Eartha Kitt and Moses Gunn. Hermina Glass Hill is the curator. She's also the founder and executive director of the Susie King Taylor Women's Institute and Ecology Center and president of the Liberty County Historical Society. When we first met Hill back in 2017, she just left her hometown of Atlanta to take up residence in Taylor's birthplace. I came here on this quest looking for something, but what I came looking for was looking for me too. Her mission to elevate Taylor's story, one she says is seldom told. I was so enamored with this woman who is from Georgia, who most Georgians and most Americans don't know, yet she played a significant role in the watershed of our, our country's moment uh, towards freedom, which was the Civil War and, and thereafter. Since that time, she's covered a lot of ground. In 2019, the Georgia Historical Society dedicated a marker to Susie King Taylor in Midway. In addition to opening the museum last year, Glass Hill traveled to Boston, where Taylor was buried, to bear witness to a history-making moment. 109 years after her death, Taylor's unmarked grave finally received a headstone. The Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War were responsible for the new headstone, uh, and we're so grateful that she is acknowledged in this way. In her constant search for knowledge, Hill continues to make fascinating discoveries. We found two additional uh, publications of Susie King Taylor uh, outside of her biography. During her contemporary times, there were others who were writing about her, like the local newspaper who in Boston who um, did an article on her as the uh, first colored woman in Boston to become an author. And then there's also her work with the Woman's Relief Corps. Her goal is to capture the essence of who Taylor was. She is, is a person whose significance is on the cusp between slavery and freedom. Born into slavery in Liberty County, Taylor made her mark as a Civil War laundress, freedom-fighting nurse, teacher, and social justice advocate. She opened schools in Savannah and Midway during a period when education was denied to black people. She even wrote her autobiography. That we know anything about her is because she wrote this sweet little 84-page um, memoir of her life in the United States Colored Troops, the first South Carolina volunteers. And it was from really uh, dissecting her book. Hill's mission has now turned into a global movement to give Taylor the respect and recognition she deserves. I had a dream that um, I would tell her story wherever I went and that uh, her story would be amplified and elevated just as Harriet Tubman's story is. On now to a nearly forgotten piece of history. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but this image, published in the June 2nd, 1973 edition of the Savannah Herald, has become more than a precious memory. It was captured by a local photographer as seven Savannah State students became the first black women to ever compete in the Miss Savannah pageant. Corrine Walker and Donna Myers were two of those contestants. I decided it was history due to the fact that uh, six other ladies and myself, we opened doors for other uh, young black females and hopefully um, encourage them that they could compete. I had an obligation to 
the other young black women in Savannah to allow them to see a black person in this uh, pageant that had previously been close to them and to help them to know that they had, they had a right and an opportunity to participate. Walker and Myers say they're honored to have played a part in opening the door for future queens of color. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to WSAV's Black History Journey. Carver State Bank is one of only 18 black-owned financial institutions in the country. Founded in 1927, it is by far the oldest commercial bank headquartered in the Savannah area. For more than half of its existence, the same man has been at the helm, Robert James. There hasn't been a time in Robert James' life that he doesn't remember being president. I was president of the of the sophomore class, I was president of the junior class, I was um, uh, active in the Omega Psi Phi fraternity and became the boss for during my junior year. For the past 50 years, he's been at the helm of Carver State Bank, one of the oldest black-owned financial institutions in the country. He's also the longest tenured banking president in the nation. I was 24 years old when I became president. I just had a birthday, so I was actually 25 years when I, on December 1, 1971, 50 years ago. I had no idea that I would stay in Savannah this long. Today, he sits at the same desk he's had for the past half century, his office surrounded by pictures of family. This is her husband. This is Alfio. He's Italian. To say he started from modest beginnings would be an understatement. We were very poor, uh, but, but we didn't really know it, <laughs> you know, see, uh, as children, because we were busy all the time. We had plenty of food. We, uh, I found out when I got to college that, um, that we grew up uh, under the poverty level. Born and raised in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, James earned a scholarship to Atlanta's Morris Brown College, where he not only excelled academically, but he participated in several extracurricular activities. If you look at my 1967-68 yearbook from college, uh, I'm on almost every uh, organization picture because I even joined the, um, the French club. Uh, <laughs> you know, did not speak much French. During his freshman and sophomore year, he even played in the marching band. And by his senior year, he joined the baseball team. Two or three positions I played. Uh, I was a backup catcher. I played uh, uh, shortstop and I played left field. But perhaps his most memorable college experience, he says, happened the first week of his freshman year when he met his future wife, a Spelman student, Shirley. We dated for four years in college and, and got married after college. Later, James became one of the first black students to enter Harvard's business school. But I had majored in accounting and minored in business administration and had a minor in economics also. Uh, so it, uh, so I started getting intrigued about a uh, business career, and so I started looking at graduate schools of business administration. At that time, I didn't know, have, I didn't have the slightest idea how difficult it is to get into the Harvard Business School. Um, I'd gotten into every other school I'd applied for. Hard work has never been a stranger to James. After graduating from Harvard, he started his career in banking at CNS and landed in Savannah after being drawn to Carver State. I was so fascinated by the, the idea that that was a bank that was owned by black people. So I was working in Atlanta when the, uh, uh, Mr. Perry decided to retire. And so this little bank in Savannah that I tried to get a job with was looking for a president. I actually wrote a, a, a five-year plan as to what I was going to be doing five years out of the business school. and. For, and and, uh, and I updated it when I took this job in Savannah to say what I was going to be doing five years down the road. And, and nowhere in that plan did it have that I was going to be still in the same job 50 years. Uh, life just takes over. When he started, Carver State had $4 million in capital. It's now $60 million. And through a recent investment by J.P. Morgan Chase, James estimates it will grow to close to $200 million over the next few years. We're expecting to be a much bigger bank uh, in the near future. James says he's maintained his success by keeping a close connection to the community. In the 1970s, he ventured into the newspaper business when he bought the Savannah Tribune, the oldest black weekly publication in the country. He sat on several boards, headed numerous projects, and earned an abundance of accolades. 
He's even listed in the History Makers, the nation's largest African-American video archive housed in the Library of Congress. His service keeps him grounded, his mission to help everyone gain financial freedom. At 75, James has no plans of slowing down. His advice to others, do what you love, work hard to be the best, and always follow your dreams. One of the um, uh, joys of life is that is doing things that, that benefit someone other than yourself. As for the future of Carver State Bank, Mr. James says there's a management plan in place. His son, who's a Harvard-educated lawyer, will take over the position when he retires. Welcome back. This year's theme for Black History Month, Black Health and Wellness, pays homage to medical scholars and health care providers. Tonight, we share the story of three generations of local dentists and the legacy they helped to create. This is the room that keeps Dr. Billy Jamerson together, where past and present reside. It's not throwaway stuff, so this is what America used to be like. There's a picture up on the wall there, and the picture says, if you see further than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And these giants are all around me in this room, because without them, I wouldn't be here. It's where he's reminded of his heritage. My grandfather started practicing in 1905, and uh, he was one of the first graduates of a dental school to practice in Savannah who were black. A third-generation dentist, Dr. Jamerson's father, John William Jamerson, Jr., and his grandfather, John William Jamerson, Sr., were both pioneers in the profession. They practiced in the old Wage Earner Savings and Loans Bank building once the heart of the city's black business community, now the Ralph Mark Gilbert Civil Rights Museum. And uh, he had a practice on the second floor from, from 1914, 15, whenever the building was built, to up until uh, actually the year of the March on Washington in 1963. So my grandfather practiced there for 58 years uh, in the Wage Earners Bank building, and most of the time in the Wage Earners Bank building. Then my father, when he graduated from Harry like my grandfather did in 1940, he decided to join my, my father. After a brief stint in the uh, uh, Air Force, he was a captain in the Air Force in the Dental Reserve Unit. So uh, he practiced there until I came along in 1980. Following his mother's advice, Dr. Jamerson bought his own building on the corner of West Henry and Habersham Streets. He's been practicing here ever since. This space, created for his father, now houses history, like his dad's x-ray machine from the 1950s, his grandfather's graduation picture, and the only photo he has of the two senior Jamersons together. That's my grandfather there, and that's my father. A historian in his own right, Jamerson is also a history maker. In 2004, he became the first black president of the Southeast District Dental Society of the Georgia Dental Association. It was during that time that he helped create change that led to a group of black Savannah dentists being posthumously awarded the Georgia Dental Association Honorable Fellowship, an acknowledgement denied to them because of their race. So coming home, seeing the, the lack of respect that the white community had for the black dental community, you know, I felt like that was an affront to you know, everything. So I decided to try to set the record straight. Jamerson is no stranger in the fight for civil rights. As was his father and grandfather, he's a lifetime member of the NAACP. In fact, the senior Jamerson was one of the founders of the Savannah branch. His son served as vice president for 25 years under the leadership of another local giant, the late W.W. Law. So I think that when America really realizes that black history is not just black history, but it's American history. And it's important because it's been covered up so long and for, for so many years that most folk don't even realize that we are here on the backs of others. It's not all about us. It's because of what they have done, the foundation that they've laid that allows us to be where we are today. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Not everyone who makes history is remembered, such as the case of former state representative Bobby Hill. Those who knew him say he was brilliant and ahead of his time. But who was Bobby Hill and why has his legacy seemingly drifted into obscurity? He was the first black state representative from Chatham County since Reconstruction. Yet today, few people recognize the name Bobby Lee Hill. 
Last September, the Interstate 16-516 interchange was dedicated in his honor, more than two decades after his death, the result of a House resolution sponsored by Representative Carl Gilliard. This is a powerful opportunity to celebrate a great man. I came by there the other day and, and it was uh, with a great deal of pride when I saw that as I left uh, 204 to get on 16, I said, hey, he's resurrected. And now people will ask, who is Bobby Hill? Simply because his name is now on that overpass. Hill was known for his skills as an orator, a trial lawyer, and a champion for civil rights. In fact, he played a vital role in the complete desegregation of the local public school system when he represented a group of black students in 1971, a move that landed him in jail. The Hill was frisked, handcuffed, and taken to the county jail, and he's lodged there at this moment. Now we have a motion for an appeal bond presently pending before the judge, Judge Victor E. Mullins, who cited him for contempt. Born in Tignall, Georgia, Hill moved to Savannah to attend college. That's where former mayor Dr. Otis Johnson met him, an encounter he says ultimately changed the course of his life. Hill was a big man on campus. Um, he was involved in the Student Government Association, uh, and uh, he was involved in the uh, college chapter of the NAACP, and that was during um, the height of the civil rights movement in Savannah. Came to know him better in the spring of, of 1963, when we had a boycott uh, on the campus, and I was a part of, of that uh, action. Hill, a senior, asked freshmen and sophomore students to fill out applications to transfer to Armstrong to put pressure on administrators to meet their demands. It was at least 50 of us came over to Armstrong, picked up applications to transfer, and unbeknownst to me, I was the only student that turned my application in to transfer. And so I attribute uh, that uprising uh, under the leadership of Hill, Brown, Quillen, and Mary Moss as the motivating factor of me ending up being the first African American to attend Armstrong. After graduating from Savannah State in 1963, Hill earned his law degree from Howard University and joined the bar in 1967. A year later, he was elected to the State House. He held his seat for 14 years before being defeated. His life began to take a downward spiral and eventually uh, he was disbarred. And he had an Achilles heel and it brought him down and uh, besmirched his career at the time. He says he hopes history won't erase Bobby Hill's legacy, but that his many accomplishments will overshadow his faults. American history is both sad and salutary. And to not deal uh, with the sad or the evil parts of this history is to do history a disservice. Among his accomplishments, Hill was listed in Who's Who Among African Americans. He was past president of the Georgia Association of Black Elected Officials and was named Legislator of the Year by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He died of cancer in 2000 at the age of 59. Thank you for joining us for WSAV's Black History Journey. As we close, we'd like to pay tribute to some of the giants we've lost over the past year. May we continue to call their names and remember their extraordinary legacies. For WSAV, I'm Kim Gusby. Good night. We reported to the police department there at Oglethorpe and Habersham, but uh, we still had to go to the back, which was a horse stable for a long time. We stood in back of the line. Uh, we couldn't go to the fountains, uh, the restroom for the black officers and blacks working around. Savannah Police Department was in the basin in a room with the mops and buckets and, and those type of things. And they didn't like it that there were black men out there wearing a gun and a badge, calling themselves enforcing the law. 
So this, it wasn't an easy task for them to do, but they held out and they uh, persevered. And you, you think of evolution, uh, look where we are today that one was eligible to be the chief of police. Southall Brown Sr., St. John Baptist Church, Savannah, Georgia. Let us pray. I was with the group, 2,221 African-American soldiers. They selected and scattered us throughout the infantry. The people in the Netherlands sent me a temporary itinerary. I'm to meet the king and the queen. I'm to meet people uh, of the American Embassy. And I'm to talk to maybe upward of a hundred young people. I pinched myself when it became apparent that I was going. You know, I wanted to be sure I was going. I wasn't dreaming. What we are experiencing and what we have experienced today if we don't pass it on to our children, it may not be around tomorrow. I've had a good ride. Yes, so I was grateful for um, just being able to go through the situation and coming out of it as strong as I did. The choir consists of survivors, fighters, family members, and friends of those who have been affected by this disease.